Chris Hopkins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I wasn't Remember quite. I can't speak from anywhere. I know. I wasn't quite anticipating that. Um, but my notes are down here, so I'm very pleased to take a call on this um, on this particular section. Only only a relatively brief. Um, uh, contribution on this uh, around the changing to the rules around school boards of trustees. I realised as I was preparing to speak on this that um, many of the points that I wanted to raise around statutory interventions rega regarding boards were actually grouped into the uh, first theme, so I can't talk about them in this one. But I do just want to say um, I, I, I will, I will uh, indulge, uh, ask for the House's indulgement Not just for a moment Not to say that I support the um, additional interventions, I think that they're a welcome thing, um, because it does actually relate to Schedule 2, which sets out the, the power and functions of a school board of trustees and how they can operate. And one of the concerns that has been raised by boards in executing these functions is that if they ask for additional advice from the Ministry of Education, the default position has been to appoint a limited statutory manager, where many of them have been saying, actually, we could, we could execute these functions much more uh, appropriately if there was uh, some gentler intervention require, uh, uh, available uh, to the government and to the minister, and I welcome the changes to that. I, I've got some um, questions around the online well, if you like, online meeting provisions and the um, ability for a board to effectively pass a resolution but not in a meeting. And clause 13 in the schedule under, what number is it? It's under number 40, meetings, um, in the schedule, says that a resolution signed or assented to in writing, whether sent by post, courier or electronic commu communication, by all members is, a valid and a f is, is as valid and effectual as if it had been passed at a meeting of the board correctly called and constituted. The, the question that I've got is whether unanimity is too, th too high a threshold for that. Um, school boards under this provision would need to convene a meeting to make a single decision if one member of the board dissented from that decision. And it seems to me that that's quite a high threshold, where if the decision is a relatively straightforward one and the board are trying to avoid the, the unnecessary expense and complication, bearing in mind that these are volunteers we're talking about, um, by, by passing a resolution by email, for example, and getting a written confirmation of the members' agreement, why, union, why unanimity? Why not simply say, maybe, maybe the threshold for a, an absentee decision, a decision without a meeting, should be higher than at a meeting, but if the resolution could be passed by majority at a meeting, why would it need unanimity for that resolution to be passed um, using a, a non-meeting mechanism, um, because it seems to me that what we're trying to do here is, is not unnecessarily require the, vo the volunteer parents who sit on school boards of trustees to attend meetings when there are non-controversial matters, say, between meetings that could be dealt with by simple resolution. Um, and I've been part of committees where, um, where resolutions are agreed to via email and, uh, and providing this written confirmation that the majority of members agree. In fact, we do it um, in some select committee processes in this parliament. Um, and that's a very sensible thing to do. It means that we don't have to meet in order to agree a, a mere formality. So, uh, so that's a question. Why, why, the, why the majority? The second um, point that I want to ask is around the combining and splitting of school boards of trustees and how these provisions relate to the provisions around communities of learning that we are going to further be debating. And some of the anxiety that's been raised by people within the educational community is that um, the communities of online learning um, provisions in this legislation combined with the ability of the minister to combine school boards of trustees could lead by default to the community of learning becoming the default governance arrangement for schools in a particular area. Um, that's an interesting debate to have. And, I, and I'm actually open to the debate. There's a, a whole lot of reasons why tomorrow's schools um, and the, has, has led to a sort of a, a silo mentality when it comes to schools. And, and there's an interesting debate about how we break out of that. And communities of learning is part of the discussion. And this provision allowing the com combining of boards is part of the discussion. What I'm interested in is where the government sees those two policies intersecting. Um, is, is it the government's desire to have the ability to create a single board of trustees for a community of learning. Um, because it, it seems to me that the two um, legislative instruments in this bill are being dealt with separately, and it's not always clear how they link. So I'd be interested in the Minister's uh, comments on that. 
Mr. Chair. The Honourable Hikia Parada.